morning, everyone. Um, if you are visiting with us the very first time, my name is Sean, and we are continuing in the book of First Timothy. So like I do every week, I usually send out an email to those uh, in the church, members of the church, just the lesson that I am doing today, so it's a little bit easier to follow along, as well as you can go double check my facts. Um, but just to begin off the, the lesson here, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you were in over your head? Where you were in a situation that was above your pay rate, where you just got overwhelmed? <laughs> Now, I remember I was thinking about this, and I was trying to find a good illustration for my life. But the only thing I can remember was there was this one time, me, my brother, and a couple friends, we, were, we had our, our push bikes, and we were ghost riding them. Now, if you don't know what that means, is it's when you ride, and you jump off, and you let it just kind of go. And we were having a competition of who could do it the furthest. And uh, so it was my brother's turn, and he did it. And he was riding, and I was over there to get the bike. And he was riding, and he ghost rides it. But when he did it, there was a parked car of a new BMW. Right there. And it was hitting straight forward. <laughs> and I was, I was probably about like 11 at the time. And they start shouting to me, hey, you got to stop the bike. But I got so uh, just overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. I just did a, a, a sacrifice mission. I ran. Instead of just grabbing the bike, I jump in front of it. <laughs> and... and and the, the, the thing that was that was sad about it, it wasn't even going that fast. It was just like you can walk up and just catch it. But I, I panicked. I dove in front of it. I hit my elbow on the ground. I'm bleeding everywhere. I get mad at my brother. I walk home and I don't play anymore. <laughs> um, I don't know if you had something like that. I don't know if you relate to me. But in this moment, when we're looking at this letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, now if you don't know who Paul is. Paul is just a leader in the church at this time. Timothy is kind of his little padawan, his guy that he's, he's, he's raising up. Timothy starts leading a church at this moment, and Paul's writing to him as he's starting to lead these churches. And Paul writes to him right when he's in Ephesus. And we see here, if we look back in Acts chapter 19, of what's been going on in Ephesus. Acts 19.10, it says, This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. So in two years, the, the word of God is spreading here. Drop down to 10 verses later, it says, in this way, the word of God spread widely and grew in power. That Timothy was not just leading one little congregation, but he must have been leading hundreds of Christians at this time. So Timothy first had Paul with him in Ephesus, but Paul had a lead to, to Macedonia and now Timothy had responsibility over all these churches. I could feel at this moment, maybe he was feeling a bit overwhelmed, right? Like, oh my gosh, Paul, why don't you just stay with me? Did you have to go to Macedonia? So he was feeling all these things, leading the churches for his very first time. And to receive this letter from Paul would have been a godsend. He would have opened it up like it was gold, right? He'd be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for sending this Paul. And so when he's receiving this letter, not only is he going to get, you know, direction from a leader, but he's going to get encouragement from a friend, right? Where Paul would have been in his life helping him out. But we talked about last week how Paul encouraged Timothy just to remain in Ephesus. You're doing your good work. Stay there. Now we're going to let him, uh, Paul in this chapter is going to give specific directions to Timothy of actually how to run the services there in Ephesus. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, looking at chapter 2 in, in 1 Timothy, of what Paul's specific instructions are to Timothy. So my title of the sermon today is, is titled, Order in Ephesus. Point number one is, Prayer is for Everyone. If you have the emails, yes, I did change up the points, but that is okay. So we're going to start it off in, in just verse 1 in chapter 2. Come on, Sean. It says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all of those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So starting this off, just giving you an understanding of what he's talking about here, is that during those times when they would go and meet together, they wouldn't say, hey, let's go to a Sunday church service. 
or let's go to the fellowship or anything like that. No, they would say, let's gather for prayer. And so every time during that context, this would be like a gathering of prayer. A Sunday service in their context is, hey, let's gather for prayer. So Paul is mainly going to be talking about, again, throughout this chapter, of actually how to have good worship services. Now, he's not going to go an order of service, like you got to three, sing three songs, wear this, do this, right? <laughs> he's not, he's not going to do that, but he's going to give um, special instructions for Timothy of what he needs to put his attention on. Yeah. So he first starts off. And do you notice the different variety of prayer that he says here? He doesn't just say pray. He gives a couple different things here. First, he says petitions. Okay, what does that mean? That means going with God and talking to God about what is on your heart. What do you specifically want? You know, sometimes people can have this, this kind of guilty heart of whenever they just ask things from God. Like, I, I can't do that. That's just being selfish. Paul says, no, you got to make sure you're, you're asking things from God. There's nothing wrong with that. You should not feel guilty about that. He talks about, okay, then just go and pray to God. Okay, we know about prayer. That's, that's a general word we usually use. Uh, but praying, I know that this is something that I've actually started implementing in my life. Is praying just means to speak to God. So I know for me, I usually would tell people that I'm, I love reading the Bible, but I can struggle a little bit more with prayer. And what has actually helped me in these past two weeks is I've stopped saying prayer. I said just talking to God. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it actually hurts to say I don't like talking to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, changing that terminology in my personal life, now I just keep saying I, I'm not going to go pray. I'm, not, I'm just going to go talk to my Father. Wow. It's actually helped me to connect more to prayer. So I used to say, okay, make sure you go pray. Intercessions. What does this word mean? It's saying praying for other people, praying for other people's needs. And he ends it off with a prayer that we can all learn to do more, is just give thanksgiving to God. Yeah. And you really don't really understand thanksgiving to God until you actually start praying. Right? Because if you're not praying, you're not bringing your wants to God, and things just happen in your life magically, you don't actually contribute that to God. You just think, oh, that's my doing, and that's somebody else's doing. It's saying, well, you've got to have thanksgiving to God. And he goes about this, he's just talking about, later on, he's saying, pray for the kings and those in authority. But he's just talking about, man, you've got to pray for everybody out there. This just puts on our heart that you've never met someone who doesn't need your prayer. Yeah. That any person that you've ever met, they always need your prayer. And the thing is, is for some of us, it can be easy to pray for some people, right? It's easy to pray for our family, our friends, ourself, our loved ones. But the question is, who might you be tempted not to pray for? That's a real question. Jesus gives us this, this example of we need to pray for our enemies, this lesson he talks about before. But it's going here, is that's, that's where thanksgiving comes from. Because give thanks for everyone. Meaning this puts on our heart, find something in every person that you need to be grateful for. Find something in them that you're grateful for. You know, even sometimes you can be like, God, I, I don't know this person that well. You must have made him in your image in some way, right? I don't really know, but God, I'm grateful that you at least done that, mm. right? Like, find something to be grateful for. And, you know, we, we might in the church understand, hey, we got to go and make disciples of all nations. But this puts it on our heart, not only do we need to make them the disciples, but even before that, we got to pray for all nations. we got to actually have them in our prayer. There's a saying here that says, it is more important important to talk to God about men than it is to talk to men about God. It is more effective to talk to God in prayer about who you're reaching out to than just reach out to people and talk to them about God. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, and the, and the good thing about this is, is that we don't have to choose one or the other, hopefully, right? We, we do both in our lives. We talk to guys, uh, men about God, we talk to God about God. So he brings them, okay, you got to pray for everyone, but he brings their attention specifically to pray for the authorities in the world. And I don't know what was going on in the culture during that time, but in today, that can even be a hard thing to pray about. Where today, in today's culture, people are inflamed about politics. You just mention someone's name, people are mad at you. People don't want to talk to you anymore, right? You just mention a certain politician's name, they call you racist, whatever it is. And it's saying here is that, you know, you've you got to pray for those in authority. It's actually funny. There are some people where they'll actually have arguments 
of who has the most corrupt government in their life. <laughs> have you ever been with people that are actually from like Africa? I know I have some friends that are from like Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa, and they get together and talk about how corrupt their government is. No, mine's more corrupt. No, mine's more corrupt. And they say, here, okay, we just got to go back. We actually just have to pray for those in authority. There's a scripture here that I want you to consider in Romans 13.1 that talks about government is God's gift to us. Yeah. Romans 13.1, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Mm -hmm. See, it just puts on our hearts that we've got to have a little bit of trust in God. The authority is not given lightly by God. It's not something he's just randomly throwing out here. Everyone have it. You have it, right? This isn't Oprah. It's, it, it, it's <laughs> like God, God specifically, he's like, I'm giving this person specifically authority for something that I ordain or I will to happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to have trust that whatever he's putting in order, we got to pray about that. These guys don't have easy jobs. I definitely wouldn't want the job to be president. There's a lot that comes into it. You gotta pray that they are making wise decisions. I know sometimes people, uh, somebody will get into office that they think that they're not qualified for, or they think they're not a good job. People will actually desire for them to do a bad job, which to me is illogical. Right? That doesn't make any sense. If they do a bad job, that affects me. That's like going to the dentist and thinking, I don't really like this guy. I hope he does a bad job. <laughs> I hope he gets fired by the way he messes up my teeth. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> you better, I don't care what you think about this guy, you better pray he does a good job. In the same way with politics. And, and whatever how you personally feel about this person, you better pray that they do a good, a good job. It affects so many people. Yeah. And so, so Paul's putting this on their heart, you gotta pray for those in authority. He says, pray for them in government, that not will they be like your buddy, your pally wally right now. He says that you will just live a peaceful life. He's saying, don't look for favors. Just just, just have peace with the government. That's all he's saying praying for. I don't know if you can kind of relate to that, where maybe you had some type of relationship where you didn't really want to be friends with the person, but you're just hoping that you'll just be at peace. I know I felt that way with a, a, a manager I had when I was working in McDonald's back in America. See, this guy had no sense of humor. And 90% of my time is wasted on making jokes <laughs> at, job, at my job. So, so he didn't like me, actually. And so I, I, I would just pray that this guy just bears with me, right? He's just, he's just peaceful towards me. I don't need to be his best friend. We don't need to go grab a beer together. It's just hopefully he can just, just stand me at my work. And so this is what he's writing to, to Timothy. It's just pray that you're just at peace. And the time that Paul was writing this letter... Christianity was just treated as a, and considered another branch of Judaism during that time in, in Rome. That it wasn't illegal yet at this moment. But, but it wouldn't stay that way. By the time that Paul died, he was actually executed by the government. And the state would start to begin to persecute believers. In the beginning, Paul was writing when they were at peace. But he was saying, keep praying for it. By the time he died, they, they weren't at peace. So we understand how, how important this prayer is to pray, right? At the moment, we live in a time where, or at least in a place, where we can preach and live out Christianity with not much, you know, opposition here in New Zealand. It's okay. You can pray. You can, you can believe it. You can do that. But that might not always be. Actually, worldwide, Christianity is... Um, the most persecuted people group in the world. But we don't, we don't see that because we live here in New Zealand or in the West. But worldwide, 11 Christians die every day because of the decision to follow Jesus. No other people group has the same numbers. Not one. And so maybe we think, oh, like crazy countries like that, like even in Nigeria, there's a big problem going on there. Crazy countries like that, okay, I understand that they need to pray for it because they're not at peace, but we need to pray that same prayer. It may not always, uh, always, always be that way here, even in New Zealand. We've got to pray, God. I pray that Christianity can still grow here in New Zealand. Yeah. 
Why? Because we understand here that the fastest growing religion right now is sophism. See, I, I turned that term right there because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tired of saying atheism because these guys actually, people that claim that they're atheists don't actually believe in no God. They actually believe that themselves are God. Right. So now I'm claiming it's something different is sophism. <laughs> right? it, it's the fastest growing religion today. It's a religion where, hey, I don't have to answer to anybody except my own heart. Right. Are you serious? I, I, I know what's true and I know what's good for me. Like, th th that's the new religion coming up today. Mm. We are in a prey that we fight against these things. People are just growing in this idolatry. Hey, I'm my own God now. And to be honest, this is a very attractive religion. That sounds great to be a God. It's like borderline Mormonism. I don't, I, I don't, don't know. Like, <laughs> that, that, that sounds awesome, right? I'm my own God. I do what I want. I live no consequences. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty picture. But no, you will see the results in your life. When you start to live that out. So he talks about this. Okay, hey, you got to make sure when you come together, you're praying about these specific things. But we're going to see the goal of why Paul calls us to do this. Continue on, verse 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So he talks about prayer. And the main goal is, yes, to please God. But the byproduct is that that God wants all people to be saved. That he wants every single person to be saved in this world. So some people might ask, okay, well, if God wants all people to be saved, then why aren't people saved? Right? Why doesn't God's desire everyone saved? Just bam, snap of his fingers, Thanos it, everyone <laughs> saved. Right? Why, why does he do that? Well, because God's desire for men to be saved is also conditioned by another godly desire that he has. See, he also has a desire to have a genuine response from all human beings. Kind of maybe our, our, you guys might have it where you, a, a young man might desire want to be married, but want to be married to someone who's going to love him. Right? We can't just say, hey, this person wants to get married, you know? Bam, go marry her. No, no, no. There's both desires that need to work together. In the same way, Jesus, God here is saying, I want all people to be saved, but they genuinely want to have it. But they, they want, they, they, the people that want to be saved, they need to come to me, though, and want it. But this is such a beautiful thing to really understand. That God loves everyone and wants us to reach out to every single person. But have you ever heard of a good idea, but then slowly realize it affects you? Maybe, I know, uh, Monica probably just, you know, talked about this a little bit. Like, we can pray, like, wow, starting a church in Samoa. Man, that sounds like a great idea. That sounds fun. That's an adventure. Well, um, who's going to go? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just looking around. Like, oh, okay, you know? <laughs> that, that happens, right? This idea of, like, hey, we got to reach out the world. Well, who's going to go? Mm -hmm. Now we start to see, oh, wow, this actually affects us. Mm -hmm. Right? God's desire to have all people saved, that, that's a great, awesome plan, God, but that, that affects us. Right? We are called to preach to all men. You're like, all men? Yes, yes, every single person. I don't know if you've ever been tempted with this, and I'm not going to lie. I've ran across men that I felt I was tempted, and I don't know if I want that person to be saved. I, I've felt that in my heart sometimes, where this person might have frustrated me. Um, got me to a point where I was impatient or frustrated, and I'm like, you know, I'm glad he doesn't want to come. Right? And that's just going back that that sometimes we think of it this way. It's like, you know, maybe you feel that way where you look at someone who's getting set free from a crime that they did, and where in your heart you want guilt. You know, you, you want to have justice. See, where we want to see justice, God just wants to see His sons and daughters free. This is where He comes back, man. I, I, I want all men to be saved. And he, he, he puts that together, right? He says he wants all men to be saved, but come to a knowledge of truth. So what is that truth that he's talking about? Well, he's going to expand on that in verse 5 and 7, uh, 5 through 7. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this person, I, uh, for this purpose, I am appointed a herod, uh, herald, and an apostle, and I am telling the truth, and I am not lying, and a true and faithful servant, teacher of the Gentiles. So he's talking about, well, what is the truth? 
He says that there is only one mediator, meaning one gap, one bridge between man and God. But there's a couple words in there already that people don't like. People nowadays don't like the word only. People don't like the word one or exclusive. These words are very popular in, in today's culture. Right? People, people want more than one option. They want to come to God and say, well, you've got to give me different paths to you. But they don't realize actually what they're saying. See, to say that they want more than one option is to say to God that the cross wasn't enough. It's to say to God that, God, that was good. You know, you gave your son and he got tortured and stuff. That, that's good. That's awesome. But God, can I have more options? God, can I have more? But do you understand how offensive that is? God would say to people like that, I can't do it anymore. I gave you the greatest demonstration of my love and the depth of which I would go to save you. I, I can't do it. I've given you the ultimate test. I've given you the ultimate example of my love. You want another option? I can't, I can't show you anything. So when people come up to, to, to God and say that, they, they don't really understand that this, this isn't just God trying to limit it and, oh, here, there's this way, you got to go my way. But this was the greatest demonstration of his love. He couldn't give you another option if he wanted to. This is the only way. See, people don't really understand salvation when they say that word. They, they only don't just want salvation, they think they deserve. And that's the thing that they get mixed up in their hearts about this. Is people have the wrong idea of salvation. They think of it as they are in the concentration camps in World War II. And God coming and saving them from this destructive world, and this is great. In fact, it's the opposite. We are the guards at the concentration camp. We are the ones that are doing the wrong to the world. And when we're put on trial to be punished for our crimes... God comes in and says, I'll take up the crime. You just change your mind. Different type of salvation. Very different. And if people got that in their minds, there's not going to be, oh, I want to do it the way I want to. I want to do it the way I, right? Nobody would do that if that wasn't the case. They wouldn't be like, oh, really? Um, well, God, I, I, I'm glad that you're taking me out of prison and stuff, but can you do it a different way? No. There, there wouldn't be this, 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 this a compromising salvation. Right, so he's going in here. You've got to understand the truth. Mm -hmm. See, for me, I, I knew I, I was not just saved from my sin. I was saved in my sin. Mm -hmm. right, when, I, when I was becoming a Christian, at least for me, I wasn't those people that was looking for. That was not my life. I was comfortable living in my sin. My brother kept inviting me to church and stuff. I kept putting it off, putting it off, and I didn't want him to invite me one more time, so I went. I was like, whatever, I'll just go. Um, and I found out that God really did love me and had a purpose in my life, um, even though I wasn't looking for God or did I, I didn't care about him. So whenever I look back at my conversion, I get to see it was all God's purpose. It had nothing to do with me. And people really need to see that when God is saving you, it's not like just saving you from a destructive life. It's, it's, it's we are doing the destruction and God is saving us from that. And in the same way, not only for salvation do people want this multi-path system, but they also want that for Christianity as well, right? They come in, okay, I'm coming through Jesus, but then there's a lot of paths to follow Jesus. Have you ever heard that? You know, I, well, I'm going to follow my own path. I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, I, I understand, and I'm not arguing that we have different responsibilities and different callings within the, the body of Christ. Okay, I understand that. I'm just talking about how people are confusing a personal relationship with God with a private relationship with God. Those are two different things. But people will come to you and say, I have, I have a personal relationship with God. Okay, let's talk about it. Let me get into it. No, 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 it's personal. No, that's private. And that's nowhere found in the being and having a relationship with God is always public. I'm, how many times do I have to confess my sin up here on the pulpit? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 all, every every Sunday I do, right? It, it, it's always public because we're all trying to help each other out. But he ends 
started off in just this beginning part of just talking about, well, hey, first, we got to make sure in our services that we're praying. Why are we praying? Because it pleases God. Why? Because God's ultimate desire is that all people be saved. The greatest way to align your goals and your purpose and your, your ambitions with God's is through prayer. Mm -hmm. See, if you're coming this morning and your goal is not God's goal for your life, I encourage you just go back and pray. Go back in your life and just pray, pray, pray about what God wants rather than just what you want. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning part, talking about prayer. And then he's going to go into a couple of different verses that are actually quite controversial throughout the religious world. And so we're going to jump into this, and if you guys can say a quick little prayer for me as I go through this. <laughs> but point number two is authority is God's to give. Come on, Sean. If you like that, I changed up that one. That one's pretty good. Uh, verse 8 through 10. It says, Therefore I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who pr profess to worship God. Okay, again, remember he's, he's going back, okay, pray, and he's talking about this again, he's talking about the order of services. But he says here he wants men to pray everywhere. Now, what this does not mean is that the church comes together and says, okay, Tyrone, you go pray on that corner. Chris, you go pray on that corner. We're going we're to spread out and pray everywhere, right? We're going to sing really loud so everyone can hear. Not that that's a bad idea, but that's not what he means. He's talking again about services and how they're ran. So again, in Ephesus, there was more than just one congregation. There's congregations everywhere. And he's saying here, I'm giving the men the authority. I want the men to lead the prayers. That's what he's talking about. So when he's saying, okay, well, lifting up your hands, this isn't more of like a command. This is just culturally what they did. Today, we, we close our hands. We pray this way, whatever you do. But back then, they would lift up their hands. So you can do whatever you want with your hands as long as you're not on your phone. You know what I mean? But, 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 but this is what he's talking about. Okay, lift up your hands. Do that. So he talks to the men about that. Okay, the men have the authority to lead the prayers in the church services. Okay, then he starts talking about giving ammunition for the women. The main thing he says here is women need to dress modestly. Now, Paul here is telling a man how to tell women to dress. I don't know about the culture during that time, but good luck, Timothy. You know what I, mean? I don't know how well this is going to go for this guy. But the main instruction was that they dress modestly. Not too much, not too little. And the thing is, is that modest, though, is sometimes, it's very subjective, right? Modest during that time, so it was talking about don't wear all these jewelry, that they can't have um, extensive hairdos, right? In our church today, I'm not sitting at the, you know, the, 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 the doors here and looking at every woman who walks by, what kind of hair do they have? You know, braids? <laughs> right back out, right? That's, that, that's not how today is working. But he's saying, well, what is modest? But sometimes, even though that's subjective, we have to teach modesty as well, yeah. right? The, the standards of modesty in our culture are, at least from my understanding, are going lower, lower, and lower. Yeah. And maybe my you know, grandfather might think the same thing for me. You know, my tie's not the right way. Okay, amen. But um, you know, the, 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 we have to teach modesty as well. So whatever modest means, we've got to learn how to do that and come before God with a standard before him. So he teaches this. And this is something that we can all learn from, even in our, in our culture today, where in the world, beauty can get you out of anything. The idea, if I just look good, I, I can get out of something. I remember, I don't know if people have seen this clip, but there was a weird moment in a morning talk show back in America where the person who was doing the talk show, the hostess, was talking about a, a, a famous man beating his wife in public. And so he's just talking about how it's gross. But it was really weird because the next comment that came out of her mouth was, but doesn't he just look so dreamy? He's tall, he's slender, muscular. That's the kind of guy that I would like to have. And the audience were clapping and laughing. And it, it, it was just a weird moment. It was like, wait, what just happened right there? Right? And today, 
th there's this thing is like if you're famous enough, if you have enough money, if you look good enough, you can get away with it. All right, so Paul's coming in here. Even with the church, we can't have that in our hearts. Mm. That's something even today we can learn. But then he's going into the, the controversial thing. See, when you're just going book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, it's not like I have to go out of my way to find controversy. Uh, <laughs> but, but it just comes up to you. But we're going to help to understand what Paul is saying here, because a lot of people have different opinions about this. Verse 11 and 12. A woman should learn in quietness in full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Okay. So understanding what this, this is saying and what it's not saying, we're kind of going to break it up a little bit. What it's first saying is when it says quietness, we got to understand that this word that's used for quietness is the same word that it was used for peaceful in verse 2 of the same chapter. So it's the same Greek word in the translations. So one time it translates quietness and peaceful. But what this really means is not that when women enter the church, they just be quiet, right? We don't have duct tape by the door. It's just, oh <laughs> that's not what we're doing. And that's not what he's teaching. He's talking about, again, the authority that's given within the church. He's saying when women come in, they should not be putting up a fight or, 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 or just like regret or pushing back towards the order of authority that God has given. Right. That they should learn in full submission what God has ordained. Again, it's not saying that women are always silent right when they walk in the church, but that it is under male authority. We can understand this with actually comparing it to another scripture, right? In 1 Corinthians 11, 5, this is talking about somewhat the same issue in the Corinth church. But it says that here, every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. So again, this might be another weird scripture that people don't know much about. Well, what it's saying here, first of all, we see that women do speak in the church. Right? So it, it knocks down that notion that women don't speak, like it's talking about in, in Timothy. So, okay, that, 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 that disqualifies it. But what it's saying here is people might read this. Okay, so wait. Today, do women have to cover their heads when they come to church then? Well, the thing is, is during that time in the, Corinth, uh, in the Corinthian culture, to have a head covering means that you were under authority. That's all it really meant. It was just a symbol that I am under someone's authority. So back then, when they had a head covering or something, it just meant they were under authority. So if a woman came in today with a head covering, we wouldn't all look at her, wow, she's under authority, right? No, we would look at her, wow, why is she wearing this, <laughs> right? It, 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 it's a different meaning in our culture. All it's saying is the same thing in Timothy, is it, it's under the authority of males. So, going back to what we talked about before, that they have to learn in quietness, mainly in peacefulness, but it says to be under full submission. This is, again, another military term, just how, how Timoth uh, Paul was writing to Timothy in chapter 1, that they have to be under full submission. Now, when you look into the military, again, I haven't been in the military, there's just things I understand, but it has to do, whenever there's a, a, a superior officer over a subordinate, it only has to do with authority, not ability. Mm. Right? It, it has nothing to do with, oh, I'm a better soldier, so I'm not going to do what you said. Right. It has nothing to do with that. It's just over authority. So God is simply just laying out for the church and its services of who's a follower and who's a leader. That's, that's all it's laying out. But in today, it can be controversial because in the worldly perspective, they see all this as someone having superiority over another. That if they're my leader, that means God is saying that they're better. Which in no sense is that what it's saying. A follower and a leader are equal value in God's eyes. Right? The thing is, is because people mess up the terminologies of authority and power. See, someone in authority has zero power. When you look at these terms, this is what I mean. So as of, if there's a car speeding down the highway, and I want to stop that car, I have no power to do so. I can't jump in front of it and push it, right? Then I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that strong. I don't have the power to do so. But if I was a police officer, someone in authority, and I told them to stop, they would stop. Even though that police officer doesn't have the physical power to do it, he has authority. 
So the power is actually in the person driving the car. They have the power to keep driving or not. But they gave the power to the person driving. So actually, all of the, all, in the church, Paul is somewhat saying in another way, the women hold the power in the church. <laughs> they, they, they have all the power. They have the power to say yes or no. You can't make them do anything, but they're going to be fully submissive. Right? And again, what this is not saying is that every man generally has authority over every woman generally. That's not what it's saying. It doesn't mean some random brother can walk in here to a sister. You gotta wear your hair like this, take off those shoes, right? And he'd be like, "Who the heck are you?" No, it's not. It's not. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about understanding the authority within the church. It, it, it's not looking at okay, all men are better than women. And in the same way, um, you know, just being a man isn't the only qualification to be a leader. That's not what it's saying either. You don't just walk in, I'm a man, I'm a leader. That's not how it works, right? It is not what it's saying. But to understand this, it's saying hey, you've got to be fully submissive to God's authority and his chain of command. But some women aren't submitting to the notion that they need to submit. But that's okay, because some men aren't submitting to the notion that they need to lead. Same way. Have you ever felt in a situation as a man... Man, do I have to make every decision? Yeah, sorry, you do. <laughs> I know I feel that. Like, what, what milk, right, do we have to buy? <laughs> is, this, is this important? I don't know. I, I got to decide. I have God's authority to do <laughs> but, 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 but yeah, so it's just, it's just understanding that, that it's actually what hurts this the most is not people not submitting. It's people using their authority wrongly. If you look throughout the history of church and around the world, what do people say why the church is bad? Is it because people aren't doing the right thing of what the pastor says to do? The pastor's great. It's just everyone not submitting. No, that's, that's usually not the problem. The problem goes back to the, I, I heard of this, this person having, you know, abusing a child. I heard of the pastor teaching the wrong doctrine. The thing that hurts most, this chain of authority, is people and men usually using that authority for their own gain. Mm. had nothing to do with women and their submission. So this is important for us as men to understand this and to take up this with, with, with respect in God's command. So Paul doesn't just say this without giving reason. He gives some reasons as well as we continue on. In verse 13 and 14, he says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Okay, so this is what Paul is telling Timothy to teach. Have you ever had someone tell you to go say something to someone and you respond in your heart? I didn't say that. <laughs> I can almost see Timothy tempted with it. Oh, you want me to say this? You want me to read this out loud? But what we're really going to understand here is we would be fools to not dive into what this is really saying. Right, just to streak this off. Oh, hey, this is just what Paul is saying. No, let's, let's really see what he's saying and hopefully be mature about what he's saying here. He gives some reasons of the order of authority. That it's not just because girls are icky or, uh, <laughs> you know, that they're less able or anything. It has nothing to do with that. He gives his first reason, in which is the order of creation. Now, I don't quite understand this, but if you read throughout the Bible, this isn't just like one time written. It's written over and over again. For some reason, this is important to God. The order of creation. Because when it comes to the order of creation, and specifically to man, it was done differently than every other species. See, for a rhino, a male rhino and a female rhino was created at the same time. With giraffes, with dolphins, male and female at the same time. But when it came to men, Adam was created first. And later on, Eve got created. It's the only time within the history of creation that that was true. So there was something that God was trying to do. See, Adam was the person who was given original authority. When he was created, he was the one that got to name all the plants and the animals. It was not Eve. For some reason, that was important for God to understand. We understand that Adam was the one who received all the commands from God. Eve received her commands from Adam. Okay, so we understand that a little bit more, that the order of creation was important to God. 
that God wanted at first Adam to be in, con in, in command and that Eve to be the helper. Okay, for some reason that's important. We may not understand fully, but to God that was important. The second reason it gives is that the difference of sins of Adam and Eve. So he goes out that, that, that Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. Both, we understand, are sinners. When we go back to Genesis, both were sinners. It's actually funny that Eve was the one, quote unquote, who sinned first, but it is never blamed on her. The fall of man is always blamed on Adam. Right? Have you ever heard, um, you know, I just live with the, 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 the sin of Eve? No one ever says that. They say the sin of Adam. Right? Even though that Eve sinned first, the blame is always on Adam. In Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, not one woman, and death came through thin, sin, in this way death came through all people because all sin. It's saying that, see, Adam had authority, meaning he had responsibility. That when you're given authority, God also gives you the responsibility. See, Adam was not deceived while Eve was, meaning is Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Adam had all the responsibility of what was going on. So Paul gives this reason, okay, the order of creation, God, maybe, I don't even know if Paul really understood this, I would assume he did, but he's saying, okay, for some reason God has, has ordained men to have original authority. And the second reason is because we differ in how we sin. He's talking about Maybe women in general, I don't know this is for everyone, obviously you can find another man who gets more deceived than women. He's saying for women mostly, they can get deceived. And so we have to have men in authority. So he brings these up to it. And then he ends with this verse, and uh, you can take it or leave it how this says. Verse 15, but women will be saved, saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. So this is actually considered in the religious world one of the most difficult scriptures to understand. And so therefore, we're just going to skip. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> um, I've, I've actually researched it for the past couple of days and trying to understand it. And now my head isn't, isn't, isn't totally on right when it comes to this verse. But there is one understanding that I did like, and I was looking into it, um, which just says that actually in the Greek translation of this verse, it doesn't say save through childbearing. It says, saved through the childbirth, meaning one exclusive, the childbirth. And I was just reading someone commenting on this about how women were saved and they had the, the at least one woman, you know, Mary, that she had the, the, the privilege to give childbirth to Christ. Right? We see throughout the chapter that it was talking about Christ was the only mediator and that's the only way we can get saved. And so for him to give a second reason to be saved doesn't really make sense within the chapter, right? Here he says there's, there's only one that you get saved, but women need an extra one. They need to have children. That's not what he really means. That's at least what I understand. Again, you can go back and double check this. But in my understanding, I like that understanding of it was through the childbirth, which means through the coming of Jesus. And again, talking as long as he continues of what he's been saying this whole time, when they have faith, love, holiness, and propriety. So, ending off this chapter, and mainly the second part of it, is how well are you submitting to God's authority in your life? For the men, how are you leading? Are you leading in the church? Are you someone who's leading your wife? Are you someone who's leading in the household, leading in places, being the example? For women, are, are you submitting to that authority? And again, we have women leading in the church, right? My, my wife leads the women. But are, are, are you submitting to what God has ordained? I know that there's sometimes where women are like, well, why do I have to submit? And men, why do I have to lead? Again, we may not fully understand, but this is what God has put in motion. So at the end of this chapter, I can see that, we, you know, Timothy, at first, he could have been overwhelmed. Got all these instructions from Paul. Looked at it and was like, okay. I know how to go back to my churches and really put on what, uh, not just what I, Timothy, know how to do and lead the church, but what God wants. He first talks about, okay, well, we need to be a church that's known for our prayers, not just for talking about God. we got to be out there and praying for it. 
You know, are, are we a church known for our prayers? When people come in here, wow, wow, these guys really pray to God. He's like, okay, well, you got to go back to the congregation to do that. And then he goes into the later fall one, okay, well, you got to follow God's appointed authority and not just our own. Be submitted to that and to see the church grow. You know, so I think when you actually start to live out this life, not just thinking what I know best, but to see God do it, you get to see the results there in Ephesus in our own church. You know, it says there again in Acts 19 that they were growing powerfully, going rapidly. And today we get to see one more baptism in our church. Today we're getting baptized right after church. Um, so what we're going to be doing, guys, if, if you have been visiting, we usually kind of stick around, tea and coffee. You might be a little disappointed and say, why is Chris lying about food? Um, that, that there is none out simply because, um, <laughs> simply because right after the church services, guys, we're going to go to Judges Bay and uh, baptize Sam. And everyone is invited if you would like to come along and celebrate with us. But with that, that's the end of the service. Thank you, guys. Come on.